people born deaf was shocked and a little dismayed to learn that they would have hearing children. You have to ask yourself, what should I think? The directions for a human being are written in code, three billion letters long. These instructions tell our bodies how to live, how to grow, how to die. Researchers call this code the sequence. In the United States, there are cultures within cultures. I'm sure you can think of some examples, but there's one that maybe you didn't think of, the Society of the Deaf. They have their own schools, traditions, and language, which leads to another interesting fact. 85% of profoundly deaf individuals marry other deaf people, and that's been going on for generations, which brings us to the subject of genetic inheritance. Okay, uh, good luck to you. Come on. The children in this family are bilingual. They're fluent in English and American Sign Language. That's because their parents, Jim and Maureen Hines, are deaf, while Emily and Joe have normal hearing. By all accounts, they're a happy, well-adjusted family, but it didn't happen the way the parents planned. I wanted deaf children. I grew up in a deaf family. I grew up in the deaf culture. I had studied sign language. I'm a linguist and research sign language. I also had taught deaf children at the elementary level. So I knew what it was like to be deaf and what it takes to be the best mom in the world. Jim and Maureen thought their children would be deaf because they were both born deaf. They both had inherited the genes for deafness from their parents. But Jim and Maureen have different kinds of deafness and that's when the rules of genetics can change the odds of inheritance. Maureen has two altered Connexin 26 genes. She got one from each parent. Jim also has a pair of altered genes. Again, one from each parent. But the cause of Jim's deafness is different from Maureen's. He has Pendred syndrome. Their children got one of the Connexin genes from Maureen and one of the Pendred genes from Jim. The result, only one of each. Not sufficient to cause hearing loss. I looked at that paper and it struck me. I couldn't believe my eyes. I looked at him and I looked back at, at Dr. Arnos and she nodded at us and said, it's almost sure, you'll have hearing kids. And I repeated it and I just burst into tears. I realized I had been lying to myself. I realized that inside I really wanted deaf children. About one infant per thousand has profound hearing impairment and half of those cases are of genetic origin. The most common cause of hearing loss in European and American populations is a mutation in the Connexin 26 genes on chromosome 13. It interrupts signaling between cells. Less common is Pendred syndrome, resulting from altered genes on chromosome 7, leading to a malformation of the inner ear. There are an estimated 300 deafness genes 70 have been mapped so far, and more are being found each year. If that couple came in for counseling, um, we could do this test for this commonest form of deafness and have a pretty good chance of, uh, well, uh, if, they have, if the child has connection to deafness, we'd have a 100% chance of identifying what the cause was. And geneticists can now also explain why the number of people with connexin deafness appears to be growing. That's because deaf people often marry deaf people. They go to the same schools, speak the same sign language, and share a lifestyle. That behavior is concentrating the genes for deafness, increasing the odds of a child getting two of the same gene. The percentage of people with just the connexin 26 form of deafness appears to have doubled in the past 100 years a statistic that may make some people uncomfortable. Changing the human gene pool clearly has ethical implications. You have to ask yourself, well, what should I think about that? I mean, what attitude should we have about a um, pattern of marriages that, that has resulted in an increased prevalence of this, um, this condition? Genetic testing could increase the prevalence of the condition even more, since a person with connection deafness who wanted to have deaf children could seek out a partner with the same genes. Whether or not this actually happens, it shows that genetic knowledge can allow an individual to make decisions never before possible. 
there's no rational basis for saying that deaf people can't marry one another because after all this is another culture and they are marrying because they are mar members of that of that culture so i think that this is a a price we have to pay as it were uh... for the freedom of association for the freedom of um, of being able to to marry uh, whomever you you want to compared with the posterior it represents uh, a kind of uh, illustration of a lot more scenarios that are coming the decisions need to be made with uh, lots of different perspectives not just the scientific perspective it needs to be made from the perspective in, in individual circumstances like deafness of those people who are affected and the debate is not just over hearing and deafness what about the genes for height or strength or intelligence all those traits that parents might want to control it's an issue most scientists can't and don't want to decide on their own scientists aren't accountable in the same way that elected officials are accountable. we don't get elected uh, and it's not our job to be uh, accountable to broad constituencies. Our job is to uh, make the discoveries. Okay. <laughs> for Jim and Maureen Hines, there is no question that everything turned out for the best. Theirs is a family with a great deal of love. And for the children, it simply means they're skilled in two kinds of communication. <laughs> it's like talking to hearing people, but with uh, hands, like, like, um, say Spanish or something, like it's talking to your parents with another language, that's all. Yeah. Um, I think it's just like talking, but only with your hands. <laughs> Marie believes her family spans two worlds, hearing and deaf. Both worlds have their moments of joy and moments of sadness, and some moments that share a little of both. One day, when she was about five, she started to cry. And I asked her what was wrong. And she said, Mom, you can't hear me singing. I want you to hear me. Well, I said to her, God wanted me to be special, and God wanted you to be special in your way. So he wanted you to be hearing and me to be deaf, and that's OK. The computer and I will be back next time with more stories from the life sciences. If you have a question for the researchers who are our sources or the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Genome, let us know. Our hope is that over time we'll all get a better handle on a subject that is as difficult as it is important. That's life. I'm Lucky Severson. The Secrets of the Sequence teaching materials were developed at Virginia Commonwealth University with funding from the National Academy of Sciences and the Pfizer Foundation. The original public television series, Secrets of the Sequence, was produced by Ward Television, with funding from Pfizer, the Pfizer Foundation, Oracle, and the Council for Biotechnology Information. Special thanks to member institutions of the series advisory board, consisting of Virginia Commonwealth University, Harvard University, University of Wisconsin, University of Michigan, University of California at San Francisco, and the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, Cambridge, England.